what are and what is the ARM trust zone. Um, but first of all, who am I? What do I do? So I dual boot Windows and Arch. Let's go. Any Arch users? Arch users? Arch users? Yeah, I have a VM. Come on. <laughs> all right. I'll take that. I'll take that. So I highly recommend if you want to learn a little more about Linux, uh, install Arch. If you have supported hardware, it's going to be a lot easier. Any ThinkPad is really supported hardware, just for the record. Uh, I will not help anyone without supported hardware, because that's out of my scope. I don't know how to work it without uh, supported hardware. Um, this year, I'm the CCDC team captain and fourth year on the team. I've been doing Windows Red Team uh, for the past couple years, mostly on persistence, how to persist um, on the box. And I'm currently working on two ARM-based projects, one as an independent study, and the other uh, for MITRE's ECTF competition uh, this semester. I think it's the third annual, which it's, they've both been pretty interesting. So just a quick overview of my independent study, because that's kind of where the research from for this presentation has been kind of pulled from while doing research for my independent study. Um, so just a, a quick one-liner on what my independent study is. Uh, my job is to implement in the open source TPM released by IBM. It's basically a C project and implement it in the secure world of the ARM trust zone on a Cortex-M processor. So, wow, that's a lot of things. What are these things? We will get into most of them, such as mo mostly the trust zone and ARM Cortex-M through this presentation. I won't be covering the TPM portion since I haven't actually got there um, in my research yet for my independent study. And we're going to be going over why trust zones are important for security nowadays and what is it in an overarching manner. So first of all, I'm going to do a little, little diff on the difference between a Cortex-M and Cortex-A. So just for um, reference, the Cortex-A is what most people have as, their, as the processor in their phone. So it's a pretty high performance processor. It can have up to like four cores, generally four to eight cores, depending how um, powerful the chip is itself. And it has very high power consumption, large instruction set, and you can actually run an OS on top of it, right? Most people's Android phones, they run a Linux kernel under the hood, might be slightly modified, but still an OS nonetheless. So the Cortex-M, though, is, is very simple compared to the Cortex-A even though both of them implement the trust zone feature implemented by ARM. And it's really just for embedded devices or applications. It runs basically just a firmware. There's no operating system that runs um, on top of the Cortex-M. It's made for low power consumption. And it's, it's honestly just meant to be very simple to use in like SCADA networks or IoT devices. So this is, I'll just go over this quickly, because some of this is slightly important from the trust zone perspective. So a couple of the physical differences of the actual components that you would um, see on the chip itself are uh, more CPU cores, obviously. Uh, there's going to be more cache for the Cortex-A CPUs, just because of the instruction set and to cache as much as they can so they can obviously process data faster. And one of the most important things that you can see on the Cortex M23 over here that has to do with trust zones is the memory protection unit. I'm going to go into this on the next slide, I believe. So I'm going to go there. So this is just a, basically a feature diff on the different features between the two. So the um, Cortex A has a couple different contexts that the processor can be in. Whereas for the Cortex-M, it's really just two contexts. There's a secure thread for the secure world and a non-secure thread for the non-secure world with handlers for exceptions. So the main thing we're going to get into through this presentation is the state transitions and the memory management. So for the Cortex-A, uh, you can pretty much think of this as a regular x86 CPU, for if you know how that works. So right, processes are isolated with virtual memory that's given. And the user land on any modern operating system that you use nowadays is isolated from the kernel land memory. 
So that, that's pretty important in the um, isolation of keeping things secure, right? And the Cortex-M doesn't really have that, though. It really just has a piece of hardware that gets configured at boot time that says, so if the unsecure land it tries to access memory from the secure world, then we throw an exception because that shouldn't happen. Untrusted code should never be wrong, should never be able to access the trusted memory of, let's say, the kernel, right, for comparison. So just cover a couple of this, but just important takeaways. So MPU, memory management unit versus MPU, memory protection unit. Uh, MPU is very simple compared to the MMU that's implemented on the Cortex-A. Uh, state transition differences. Cortex-A is a software state transition. So the stack is actually, um, the stack transitions, right, between the worlds is done in software. So it's done basically at compile time. But it's for the Cortex-M, it's actually done by the hardware itself. So nowhere in the code you're going to see, um, like, registers getting pushed to the stack, right, and cleared. Because that's all done in the hardware itself. So finally, we reached a diagram here. Hardware-based software isolation. So that, this is one of the most interesting things, probably, that I learned while researching the Trust Zone. Because most of the things that you think happen in uh, hardware on an x86 CPU are really just happening in software. So it's, it's pretty interesting to think about the hardware actually doing some real work and making very fast state transitions between the non-secure and secure world. Um, and so this actually allows a secure application to control the non-secure application's access to the system itself. So I'll have a better diagram for what that actually means in the next slide, I believe. But you can just think of the secure world being used kind of like a library for the non-secure world which kind of keeps it isolated from all the hardware, all the um, system resources, right, that you might deem not necessary for the non-secure world to access, like encryption keys, for example. Um, so this is kind of more a, a definitive picture or diagram for how the accesses actually occur. So the non-secure callable memory is really just a portion of the flash that gets um, set basically at boot time in NVRAM, or in NVRAM that gets um, set to the processor, right, at boot time. And the secure gateway instruction is actually the instruction used by that uh, intermediate library to transition, tell the processor to push everything to the stack, zero out the registers, and now we're going to run code in the secure world. So th that right there is, is very interesting because x86 has, no, has nothing even like close to this for the sense of security and process isolation because it just wouldn't be as fast, I guess. Well, for, you can't run an OS, right, that does this. This is, this is just firmware. So this is specifically... Uh, the Cortex M implementation, I should I should have noted. And with the uh, the secure world, the secure world can actually call code or functions in the non-secure world if it implements something that, let's say, the secure world should access. This can be like a user library function that the secure world needs to add, know where its data is, right? And there's a little less of a state transition there because it's assumed that the secure library is written securely. And that's generally a, a large ex uh, assumption, but usually one that's made you know, throughout every computing device you use. Something always has, always has to be known or assumed uh, is secure or trusted. So this is actually how direct memory or access is prevented. So when the non-secure code tries to call a function that the secure world provides, uh, it has to go through this non-secure callable code, or you, we can just say the uh, 
the non-secure gateway, right? So the only thing this non-secure gateway does is the state transition. It doesn't have any functional code inside of it. It really just makes a hop from the non-secure code to the secure code. So that's super important because then the non-secure code can't make a direct pointer to the memory that a function lives in in the secure world. So that itself is just entirely isolating that memory space. And even if the non-secure world gets a direct pointer to a function in the secure world, it could be any function, any memory, right? Because if you try to read memory, it could be an encryption key. It could be sensitive information. That'll actually trigger a secure fault exception, which is what happens when we saw the handler beforehand. So there's thread. There's a thread and a handler. And exception handlers uh, would be running if this secure fault exception uh, occurs to try and see what happened and diagnose if we have to reboot the system, can we just restart the client application, or anything like that, any type of remediation that would occur from uh, this exception. And there's a couple different things, but as you can see, to, for the non-secure code to even access the secure code, it has to go through this library, use the SG instruction, and then the S, that library itself, which when you're actually writing the code for this, that literally gets compiled to a library that only has the function definitions for what the non-secure code is able to call. So let's say we want to turn an LED on on uh, a motherboard, right? It's going to call a function defined in this NSC. It's going to go to the secure world, and the secure world actually does the work for that. So just think, try to think about it that way. So any access to m most hardware, that's going to go through the secure code because you don't really want to give hardware access to somebody who could do whatever they want with the hardware. So one of the biggest kind of like interesting things about this project is that we're in like the computing world, we're normally used to, you know, we have code that runs code and our application gets run by an OS. In this project, None of this is a thing. This is literally just sequential operations that might have a state transition in the middle. So on the left-hand side, this is, so this is the entire portion of Flash that would be used for your program. So when we think of like how Windows runs, how Linux runs, this is like a drastic difference. Because we don't even need a bootloader. Right. If we go on the right, so the, the, this, the most simple way that this works right, is the hardware starts executing code from memory zero in the flash. So it starts reading in data from memory address zero and starts executing that in a sequential manner. Super simple. And it took way too long for me to see how this actually worked. Because there's like tons of documentation at like the hardware level of what is actually going on during the boot process. So it was like pretty interesting to go through the process. But basically, as we can see, this uh, app NSC flash region right here, this is the only thing that the app NSC, non-secure, can jump to in order to access functions that are provided by the secure world. So it might have access to this memory region itself, but in no way can it directly read arbitrary memory from the non-secure area, region, or definitely can't read memory from the um, secure region, which is the only way uh, it's defined to work, which is it's pretty interesting. So few settings. These are basically the settings that define what these memory offsets are in the flash. So when you link your program together, you have to define a file that says, OK, I want to put the secure program here, the non-secure callable program here, and the non-secure program here. And this might look kind of cryptic here, but you can basically just place like arbitrary memory values in the place of this equation. 
And so that's what all this defines. So this, pro, this boot prot right here, that defines this boot prot variable. And this is done in non-volatile memory. So it knows when the hardware starts that we're going to execute these instructions first. And then eventually, this memory region is going to jump to the next one. And that it just it needs to know that in order to start executing whatever program we wrote. So I, I won't go over this too much in depth, but this is basically just the same as this, except they have this in the documentation. And so I actually did this presentation for my independent study group uh, a couple days ago, and they were pretty interested in this information as long as um, my sponsoring professor. So I kind of like just provided this information for them and showed like how we could set the values in this fuse. So this is actually in the debugger uh, that we can connect the board to to our laptop in order to debug the board while the, our code is running to see the registers, memory addresses, and we can even do a dump of the entire flash if we need to see other issues that are occurring. So the next steps for my independent study are to take a more in-depth look at the TPM implementation, decide how to port it to ARM, because originally it was written for Linux, which even that is going to be interesting. I'm kind of expecting to continue this as my MS Capstone project as well. So we'll see how that goes. We'll see how far we get on this at the end of this semester. Um, design the model around being the secure application in the architecture. And we, have, we don't need a bootloader at this point in time, because we can just slap that on later. Bootloaders in this context for embedded devices are mostly just meant for updating the applications themselves. So updating the secure application or the non-secure application to, let's say, version 2. And then begin implementing the actual code. So that's all I got. Any questions? Yeah? Do you know why they called them fuses? At first, I thought you were talking about like the file system thing. And then it clicked like, oh, like, sounds like a physical fuse that would break. So I honestly don't know why. The, OK, I'm sorry. So Joe asked why they call them fuse settings. It sounds like it's a physical thing on uh, the board. So in this case, it's not. I feel like you're right. They might have been at some point. But if, if any of you know what a hardware register is, it's really just a place in memory that a value is set that hardware is set to check. So it might be memory mapped to a different region of flash, not in the main block. But um, they're, they're literally, it's just another uh, area of flash that these settings are set in, basically. Yeah. Awesome.